Feast TV is brought to you with support from Missouri Wines, Whole Foods Market, La Col Culinaire, and the Raphael Hotel. This is the breakfast episode from eggs to maple syrup. I'm Kat Neville and this is Feast TV. You have made me very happy, thank you. Those are as big as my head. Breakfast, as they say, is the most important meal of the day, and we're here at Town Topic in Kansas City to kind of lay the groundwork for our breakfast episode. You're going to be meeting some really interesting people in this next half hour, and our first stop is near Columbia, Missouri, at one of the country's largest free-range egg producers. Good morning from the Columbia Farmers Market here in the heart of Missouri. Today we are spending the afternoon with Stanton Brothers Eggs. It's two brothers and just wait until you hear their story. You don't know how many the chicken cross the road jokes <laughs> I've gone through and I still really don't know <laughs> the answer. <laughs> On the plus side, I've started making excellent puns. <laughs> Thank you and you have a nice week. All right, I think it's time that we head to the farm and meet the chickens. So we're here at the farm and I have to say when we drove up the street, when you say that this is a free range chicken operation, there were chickens running across the dirt street. We're surrounded by thousands of very sweet brown chickens. It's amazing. I've never seen something like this before walking onto this farm. Yeah. <laughs> A lot of them are kind of gathered together here. Is this where the majority of their food is or where they roost or? Both, yeah. Um, so these are really habitual chickens. <laughs> so they go literally wherever they want. Yeah. <laughs> that is their home, but they still go everywhere. Now, we don't really have a yard anymore. <laughs> <No. laughs> kind of taking that over too. Yeah. Tell me how this all came about. How did this happen? A lot of it's by accident, honestly. <laughs> Uh, way back when, in the first grade, we had the local 4-H here in town. Um, they incubated baby chicks for our class. Um, at the end of that project, one of the kids got to take them home. Uh, I was the only kid that won those baby chicks too. Um, I thought I had them too until the very last day. And then another girl put her name in the hat also to win them. Um, and of course, the girl won. <laughs> so I came home a little teary-eyed, but my uncle was here. I um, kind of told him what had happened that day. Came home the next day and had my first six chicks. So you're six years old? Six years old at the time. Um, my parents decided to let me keep them and it'd be a way for me to have an allowance rather than just give me money. Uh, we could sell the eggs to people that went to our church, neighbors, friends, and the like, and kind of start our own little business from that. Now we actually have over 20,000 layers. It's amazing. So, the nation's largest free range independent egg operation. And that's what's incredible. I mean, it's not just that this is big for just any kind of standard, it's the nation's largest. Right. And you started it when you were six. Six. And how yep. old are you now? Uh, 23. Right. Not <laughs> yeah. very old. And then you work with your brother. Absolutely. Yeah. So four years after the first grade, when he started the first grade, we kind of made a partnership together. He does a lot of the production part of the business, so taking care of the chickens, growing the grains, um, daily chores like that. And then I'm more of the business end, the sales and marketing type of things, and the paperwork, which gets to be fun too. <laughs> But we work together in that aspect, and we both farm together with the business. That's wonderful. Tell me about your parents' farm, because that's where we are, right? Isn't right. this your, your dad's farm? Right, yeah. So we're on a traditional Missouri family farm. 
Um, the parents, they're both full-time self-employed farmers, uh, they have beef, cattle, and row crops. Um, and so with those crops, we grow soybeans and grain sorghum, or milo. And we use the milo to actually grow that on the farm, and we grind that back for the chickens and the cattle as well. That's great. So it's integrated all together. And so why did you end up making this open range, um, as opposed to doing a confinement operation? Uh, to begin with, literally I was six years old. <laughs> I wasn't going to spend that much money to put something up like that. <laughs> Um, just kind of use what you had, you know. Some people want to go big and go fancy. That's fantastic. But we kind of used what we had and we built upon that over the years. Um, also, the chickens are fed, you know, the grass, the grains, things like that, the insects. So there is a difference. There's a niche market with the brown local eggs, you know, cage free and free range. And so we have that aspect of it as well. So an egg laid by a chicken, like the ones that are here, the yolk is going to be intensely orange. It's going to stand up. It's very different from those kind of sad, pale yellow yolks that you see in a lot of grocery store eggs. Yeah, all of our eggs, the ones that go to the grocery stores especially, they're less than a week old when they get there. Um, and then the milo itself is more of a difference. They, it's a poultry grain. We grind that back for them, so that also helps darken the yolk as well. It's great. What do you love most about it? Really working with family. I mean, that was always the goal, to stay on the family farm. Um, with traditional farming, it's really hard. So this is a way for both us and I to raise our own families, as well as our parents to have their own income from the farm as well. What is it like for you to be at the farmer's market and actually see your customer face to face? Oh, I, I love it to death. When we first started selling there, we had really poor luck actually. The very first Saturday we sold, I think it rained, and we sold half a dozen. Oh! <laughs> On the second Saturday I think it snowed, and but we doubled, we sold a whole dozen. <laughs> the third Saturday wasn't that great, and then the fourth we kind of got going and started to build up. And what's really kept me going, what I like the most about it, is meeting the customer, building that rapport. Um, do we need to still go there and sell? Probably not. We could find somewhere else, but I love meeting the customer. And so non-GMO, free range, it kind of happened by accident, but like you said, right. so many people are looking for this and, right. and really are seeking it out. Right. So where do you see this going? Long term is continue to grow, diversify. That's great. whole aspect of agriculture and farming. And that's something that just always fascinated me. And so it's a unique way to continue that. And that's really what's kept us into it, um, with the family aspect and the community and the consumer all together too. Your story's amazing. And now it's like the biggest free range chicken operation in the country. There's something to be said for having that kind of entrepreneurial spirit where you're creating a product that you're proud of and it's something that truly there's a demand for. Yeah. It's very cool. Next up, we're going to visit with one of the Midwest's top maple syrup producers in southern Indiana. He's doing some really innovative things with spent spirit barrels. Just wait until you meet Tim Burton. So tell me about the festival that you founded, the Maple Syrup Festival. Sure, yeah, we, we started the festival here on my farm uh, about six years ago. The, the reason we started it was to benefit the Heads Up Foundation, which, which is a nonprofit organization that benefits children that are born with craniofacial anomalies. Uh, I was born with a cleft lip. My niece, Caitlin, was born with a unilateral cleft lip and palate. And so when that happened, uh, we as a family kind of got together and said, hey, how can we help other families and kids, and so they came up with the Heads Up Foundation. Fantastic. Yeah, and so that's that was the reason we started the National Maple Syrup Festival. People have come from all over the United States to get, come to this festival, and so you can go to the festival and try all these different grades of maple syrup from Connecticut, Vermont, New Hampshire, Maine, Michigan, Wisconsin, and on and on and on. That's so cool. The process is really deceptively simple, right, of making very. syrup? I mean, it's very, very simple. And 
I think that would surprise a lot of people. So we'll have a tap, and so what we'll do is we'll put this into what's called the cambium layer of the tree. The cambium layer of the tree is between the bark and the hardwood. So sap doesn't flow past the hardwood. I didn't realize that. Yeah, yeah, so it's very, very simple. We collect the sap, we boil it down, and reduction, reduction, reduction. It takes 40 gallons of sap to make one gallon of maple syrup. That's what's amazing. It is, and, it's, and that's what we try to pass along to people. That's why pure maple syrup is so expensive. Um, it's not flavored corn syrup. It's the real deal. You know, when it comes out of the tree, it looks just like water. I couldn't hold a clear glass up with tap water from the sink mm -hmm. or sap water from the tree, and I couldn't tell you what the difference between the two. I can taste it, and that sap is gonna just have a hint of just sweetness. Just a tinge. Yeah, yeah, because, you know, you're, you're only talking 1.5 to 2% sugar, mm -hmm. you know? I have one maple at the corner of the sugar house, and it was measuring 6%, 6%. That's huge for a maple syrup maker because now you, you don't even need 20 gallons to make a gallon of maple syrup mm -hmm. because it's tripled the, the sugar levels. Like your single magical tree. I, I actually have been called out because I, I, I hugged the tree and I gave it a smooch. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Uh, this is an evaporator, a maple syrup evaporator. So what we'll do is we'll bring in sap and we'll boil the sap uh, in this large pan. All the sugar from the, the maple sap stays in this pan and all of the non-sugared water goes up and through the main uh, hood, which is this right here. So that will evaporate and all the sugar stays in this pan. And as the sugar concentration increases, it goes through a series of holes here. By the time it comes out to the other side, where we start drawing it off, it's at 67% sugar. And so we want to draw it off really slow, so slow that the evaporator can keep up with the syrup that's flowing out. We could produce about 12 to 13 gallons per hour. And your syrups in particular, they can be used on pancakes and waffles, but they have a lot of culinary um, applications beyond that. They do, and, and one of the things that we've done is we have started to barrel age our maple syrups, and we're doing these cool collaborations with distillers around the country. Mm -hmm. This particular one's out of Texas. That's Ranger Creek, a straight bourbon whiskey barrel aged maple syrup, and we're able to pick up the notes from the barrel into the syrup through a process that we call fire infusion. So inside of this amazing building, there is a very large fireplace that I desperately want, <laughs> of one of my own. Um, is that where the fire infusion happens with the barrels? It is, it is. So what we'll do is we'll take these barrels and we'll put them on these barrel racks and we'll take a floor jack and we'll push them as close to the fire as we can and we'll raise the internal temperature of the barrel 30 degrees above the ambient air temperature. Wow. Yeah, and we do this twice a month for a year. Does it freak you out that you might catch them on fire? And we've come close. <laughs> we've All come that close. maple syrup? Yeah, we've come close, but we don't leave it. I mean, we're, you know, we're, we're monitoring it and that type of thing. Are you the only folks that do that? As far as I'm aware of. Yeah, I was gonna say, that's a very unique process. How did all of the barrel aging collaborations come about? You know, we got into this at a great time. There's a renaissance that's going on with, with the food movement and that type of thing. And I deal with a lot of chefs up in Chicago, and you know, it's cutting edge. I mean, some of the things that they're doing with the food is unbelievable. And it just kind of evolved from there. So I would say the reason that I got into it, I wanted it to be different, and so that chefs can use it uh, beyond, you know, waffles, pancakes, and crepes. Previously, if you decided to make some maple syrup, there never would have been a connection for you in Colorado or in Chicago or Florida right. or anything like that. But right. the current zeitgeist of our food system has created these opportunities for people to really collaborate and create these amazing new products that you've never seen before. The demand for our stuff has increased so much. And so I, I, I like to think that it's expanding the horizons for all of us. Absolutely. When this is your office, you win. Yeah, <laughs> you could say that again. Yeah.
The next stop on our tour of breakfast is down in Springfield at a spot that makes amazing, real, New York style boiled bagels. Hey Bethany. Hi. It's good to see you. <laughs> I am here at Legacy Bagelry in Springfield, Missouri. This is the home of some of the best bagels that I've ever had, and we're going to meet the couple behind them today. How did bagels happen for you? I mean, where did that even come from? Originally, we were kind of like just working together with family businesses and stuff, and we had kind of wanted to do something together, but on our own. and something to support ourselves. So once we got to this Springfield area, we started baking our own bagels. We did wholesale. We ended up growing out of the kitchen that we rented, and then we opened up our own bakery space. It's almost impossible to find a good bagel <laughs> in this part of the country. I mean, really, the, the actual boiled bagels. So where did you learn that technique? We learned it on our own because we would bake them for the farmer's market, which you can sell from a home kitchen. So we made thousands of bagels and we boiled them with like three different pots of water, every pot we had, and then we cooked them in like little 18 inch ovens. You know, it was a lot of experimenting. Well, I remember the very first time that I came into Legacy Bagel Reads, the moment I tried one of these bagels, I was in love. <laughs> it is delicious, delicious. And until you have an authentic bagel like this, you just don't know what a bagel can actually be. Yep. Why is it important to you to have those wholesome, organic, non-processed ingredients? Why does that matter? Once I started having kids, it was just like, we need to watch these things. So we just started to really understand more about how farming has changed and everything has changed and it really wasn't meant to be that way. So I, I think it's just more about like, we learned personally what we want to be putting into our bodies. What I like about what you're doing is that there aren't any gimmicks. You're doing traditional food in the right way. You're not, you know, putting some cutesy spin on it. It's just real, honest food. We want to do it right, so. <laughs> What makes a bagel a bagel? Uh, a bagel differs from a lot of other things in the fact that uh, the recipe is very simple. There's only five ingredients in a, in a, in a bagel. Um, it differs from bread, especially, um, mainly in its process, which is kind of what gives it that characteristic flavor. How did you develop the process of doing these very traditional boiled bagels? Because not a lot of people bother with the boiling stuff. There are processes that mimic this, um, but do, still don't get the full quality of an actual boiled and handmade bagel. Um, a bagel should have a very rich, complex flavor, similar to a cup of coffee. A cup of coffee, when you drink it, you realize, hey, I get notes of this, this, and this in the coffee. It's kind of the same with a bagel. We look for certain notes within the bagel and what's your favorite? My favorite bagel is actually the poppy seed bagel. Yeah? The, the subtle nuances in the flavor of just the, the plain bagel with the nutty topping of a poppy seed. Once it's baked, it kind of gets a nutty flavor. Um, that's my favorite. What do you envision for Legacy Bagelry kind of going forward? Where do you want to take it? We actually had discussed opening up a second location. Um, Tell me it's going to be in St. Louis. We haven't decided yet, but we do know that that's probably going to be a little ways down the road. Everything that we do is slow. We follow that same model with our business. We want to get it perfect before we do it again. And it's obviously not a simple process. <laughs> so that is the plan eventually is to do, to do something like that. I feel like what you guys are doing here really yeah. embodies the current ethos of what food should be. Exactly. The, the process lends itself to that. Whereas most people, the process is too quick, they don't use as high quality ingredients, and then you, so therefore you don't get those flavors. The ingredients and time put into it really make a difference. Oh, well, and you can taste the difference. Definitely. Let me just tell you. Definitely. You can taste the difference, you need to have these bagels. <laughs> Thank you.
So we've just seen how three artisan food producers are making breakfast staples. And when I was brainstorming what recipe I wanted to make for this episode, I kind of played around with some different breakfast specific ideas. And I realized what I'd rather do is show you how to use a breakfast staple, meaning maple syrup, in an unconventional way. So I am going to make braised short ribs with a red wine and maple glaze. It's gonna be served with a little bit of egg noodles with some brown butter, and I'm gonna pair it with a chambersen from Edgecliff. And chambersen is a very nicely acidic wine that has more of a light flavor characteristic than Norton. And I'm going to be using about a cup, cup and a half of the wine in the braise, and I'm also gonna be pairing it with the finished dish. So I'm gonna get this started. These short ribs are gorgeous, and they are bone in. You can do the boneless, it'll cook a little bit faster, but having the bone in, you're gonna get deeper flavor in the final result. So all I'm gonna do now is salt and pepper these guys, and then I'm gonna quickly sear them in my pot. All right, so in my pot, I'm just gonna put a little bit of grapeseed oil, and I'm using grapeseed because it is flavor neutral and also has a very high smoke point. So as I'm browning these, it's not gonna burn. You do not want to overcrowd your pan because then whatever is in your pan, whether it's short ribs or fried chicken, will steam rather than cook properly. So what you're looking for is a really beautifully caramelized crust. And the meat will tell you when it's ready. It'll easily release from the bottom of the pan. We're gonna brown these on all sides. Of course, they're not cooked through. The idea is just to get that exterior beautifully brown. It's gonna add a wonderful layer of flavor. And it also is creating a fond on the bottom of this pan that we're going to use again to create flavor during the cooking process. So I'm gonna go ahead and get my veggies ready. Just some pearl onions, carrots, and garlic, and of course, mushrooms, beef and mushrooms. One of my favorite combinations. I'm gonna get these cleaned up and chopped. So that's gonna get nice and warm, and then I'm gonna put in my onions, the carrots, and then I'm gonna go ahead and smash some garlic cloves. So each element that I add, I want to let it caramelize a tiny bit, and then I'm going to deglaze everything with that gorgeous chambersen. So I'm gonna let my mushrooms cook just a little bit. Again, I wanna get that tiny bit of caramelization on the exterior, and then I'm gonna put in some tomato paste, my chambersen, and then some beef broth. Oh, it smells so good. I'm gonna toss in a couple of bay leaves. Last ingredient before I put my beef ribs back in there is some rosemary. Now I'm not gonna chop it up, I'm just gonna put a couple of sprigs in so that then at the end of the cooking process I can pull it back out along with that bay leaf. I want it to infuse its flavor, but I don't want it to overwhelm everything else that's in the pot and rosemary can do that. All right, I'm gonna put my beef ribs into the braising liquid. And what makes it a braise, as opposed to a stew or a soup or something like that, is that the meat sticks up out of the liquid. So it's cooking in liquid, but it's not entirely submerged. Braising lends a really wonderful, tender texture to anything that you're cooking. I have my oven preheated to 350, 375, what I'm gonna do is go ahead and cover this, and then I'm gonna pop it in the oven. So it's been about an hour and a half, and I've just drained my egg noodles, which are gonna be served on the side, so I'm gonna go grab the short ribs. Here we go, the moment of truth. This is beautiful. Absolutely gorgeous. Heat's coming up on this bad boy, and I'm gonna go ahead and reduce the sauce, take the vegetables out, and ladle them 
in between all of these short ribs. And I'm gonna make my brown butter. Once my butter is nice and browned, I'm just gonna toss the egg noodles in, pepper it, and then put it in that bowl. I'm gonna go ahead and chop up some parsley that I'm gonna stir into the sauce once it's reduced to the point where I'm happy and I've already stirred in my maple syrup. Okay, so we're getting there. It's getting really rich, really thick, and it is time for me to add my maple syrup. Love maple syrup. It is a much more interesting flavor than just plain sugar. And this is a grade B maple syrup from Burton's. I'm gonna add about a quarter of a cup. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and stir in my parsley. So adding in sugar at this stage not only adds a new dimension of flavor, but it changes the texture. It's helping the sauce to thicken up, but also deepen the color. It's this beautiful mahogany. Now I'm pairing this amazing dish with the same chamberson that I used when I was cooking. This is from Edgecliff in Missouri, and chamberson similar to a Pinot Noir, is a lighter style red, and it's gonna go beautifully with that sweet, rich flavor that we've created here with these short ribs. So cheers to maple syrup and all of those other wonderful breakfast staples that we explored in this episode, and I hope you have some ideas for how to incorporate maple syrup into something other than your breakfast dishes. Cheers, and I'll see you next time.